So the good news of the gospel to us this morning is that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. And I want to argue that this means at least three things. First of all, it means that Jesus is the Lord over all creation. Second, it means that because Jesus was resurrected from the dead, we too have the promise and the assurance that we will rise from the grave as well. And third, it means that Jesus' resurrection life comes bursting out of unexpected places. And so let's dive into that first point, that Jesus is Lord over all creation. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to our New Testament reading from this morning. Verse 15 starts with this. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. That word preeminent just means that he might have first place in all things. And I I just want to point your attention how much creation imagery is packed into these four short verses, how much much Genesis 1 language, John chapter 1 language is packed into these verses. We have Jesus, the image of God. Humanity was created in the image of God. We have the mention of creation, the word created, heaven and earth. This is Genesis 1 creation imagery. And biblical scholar Douglas Moo points out, that Paul is using creation imagery to talk about how Jesus is Lord over all creation, but also by becoming the firstborn from the dead, that he's also Lord over the new creation. Before God made anything that exists, Jesus, the Son of God, was. And as God the Father spoke the heavens and the earth, the sun and the moon and the stars and animals and fish in the sea, and you and I, As he was speaking them into creation, Jesus was the word, the logos that he used to speak all these things into being. All things were made through him. And in him, all things in creation hold together. And all things, including you and me, were created for his glory and for his praise that in all things in creation, Jesus might have first place. Amen? And Jesus as he bursts forth from the tomb, proves that he is not only the Lord over this fallen, broken world, but that he is also the the risen Lord over the new creation, that with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has begun his new creation. And that as Jesus swallowed up the penalty of death, the penalty for your sin and for mine, as Jesus swallowed that up and was buried in the tomb, death could not hold him. But Jesus rose victorious from the grave. Jesus, the hinge point between the old fallen creation and new creation. That as Jesus entered in and paid the price for our sin, he bursts forth from the grave, becoming the hinge point, the linchpin between this old fallen broken creation that we are all too familiar with. And the hopeful young dawn of new life that we all are so hungry for. That in all things, Jesus might take number one position. That Jesus might be Lord, not only over the creation, but also over the new creation. Unchanging God. Sovereign over all. So why is it important? What does that really mean to us? How does that change things for you and for I? And why do we have to continue to return to this thing that happened 2,000 years ago? Well, we have to do it because so often it does not look like Jesus is Lord. Maybe death is Lord. Maybe sin, maybe corruption, maybe pain. There might be all kinds of different Lords that are not the risen Lord Jesus. But through his resurrection and by returning to that fact, we return to the reality that Jesus is Lord over all these other things that break our hearts and break this world. We have to return to the fact that Jesus is Lord because so often things don't look that way. (laughs) 
And even as I look around this room and see everyone wearing masks it, and seated social distance, it breaks, it breaks our hearts. This past year has broken our hearts. Maybe sickness is Lord. <laughs> but not Jesus, right? No. The resurrection reality proclaims the fact that Jesus is Lord over all creation and new creation. And he is bringing that new creation where every tear will be wiped away, every sickness healed, every unreconciled relationship made right, and death itself swallowed up. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Jesus has done away with it all. And he's doing away with it all, even in the midst of this broken and fallen creation. So we have to return to the good news that Jesus is Lord Proclaimed through the resurrection because so often it doesn't look in this world like Jesus is Lord. But he is. He is good. And so Jesus is Lord over all creation. The second thing that his resurrection means is that we will all be resurrected. Now to understand this, we have to dig a little bit into the first century uh, worldview. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 11, our gospel reading from this morning. Scholars debate about this, as scholars are wont to do, but it seems evident that most Jewish people in, in Jesus' time in the first century believed that at the end of time, God would, would resurrect all of his people to share the world to come, the age to come with him. That at the end of time, death would be undone and God would raise his people from the grave to share eternity with him. And so we see a living, a living example of this um, in the words of Martha. I'll, I'll start at verse 21. Lazarus has just died. Jesus' beloved friend, Mary and Martha's brother. He's just died. And they had called to Jesus and said, will you come? You're, the one who you love is sick. And Jesus shows up what looks like too late. Because Lazarus has died. And Jesus shows up. And this is the conversation that transpires. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Martha knows what the right theological answer is. <laughs> she knows Orthodox Jewish belief in the first century that at the end of time, Lazarus will rise again. And, and I, I don't know what tone Martha said this in, but I imagine there was not a ton of comfort in her voice at these words. But then listen to Jesus' response, standing right in front of her in flesh and blood. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus shows up and it makes a world of difference. Because you see, Almost all of the Jewish people in the first century expected a great resurrection at the end of time. But what nobody in the first century world expected was for one singular man to rise from the dead in advance of everybody else. But yet that is what Jesus did. And so I love Colossians 1.18 and how it says Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. I also love Romans 8.29, which says that Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers. And I'll tell you why I love that title is because I'm a younger brother. And so younger brothers and sisters, show yourselves. Who are you? Awesome. I'm in good company. Um, older brothers and si oldest brothers and sisters, will you raise your hands? on behalf of all the younger siblings, we thank you. <laughs> we thank you because you had to pioneer some difficult things for us. Um, and based on what you did, um, we decided, oh, that was a good idea. I'm going to do that. Or, oh, that did not go so well. I'm going to go this other way. Um, but nonetheless, you did a lot of difficult things before we did. You probably had to do chores before we did. You had to go to middle school before we did. And oh, Lord have mercy. That's a tough one. You had to go to high school before we did. You had to go to college or find a job, do things like that. So you had to do a lot of difficult things before we younger siblings did. But let me tell you what. I was born to a family of three, my mom, my dad, um, and my older brother named Ethan. And I am so grateful for Ethan. Some of you may have met him. He lives here. He's come to church sometimes. Um, he's not here today because I told him I'd be talking about him. Um, and so, but I am so grateful for my brother, Ethan, because he, I was born seven and a half years after he was. Um, and so 
I just loved hanging out with him and his older friends. And I loved watching my older brother do things. Like even chores, like mowing the lawn, I would just watch him and be like, oh man, that's so cool. Look at him mowing that lawn. <laughs> and my parents have an acre and a half. And so eventually he got to use the riding mower. It's got a steering wheel and like a gear shift and all these things. It's like, oh man, look at him. He's just driving all over. I'm going to get to do that someday. That's so cool. I'm going to get to mow the lawn. It's funny what kids get excited about, isn't it? Um, but then he got a cell phone. And it's like, oh, cool. Someday I'll get a cell phone. And I'm getting to do all these things well before he did, right? I mean, older brothers and sisters, I'm so sorry. You know, most of the time your younger siblings just get to do these things well before you do. That's just the way it goes. But as a younger brother, I just loved it. And then when I was around 10 years old, I think my mom kind of like pressured him to let like me tag along with him and his, his friends. And so I'm 10 years old looking up to these guys. They're 17. Man, they got it figured out. They're smart. They're strong. They know, they're confident. They know how to fit in. I, I don't think they probably felt that way at the time. But as a 10-year-old man, oh, 17-year-olds, they got it going on. And so, so I loved seeing my brother going to hang out with them because it meant that I would get to go hang out with them. So if he went to a friend's house to play video games, I'd get to go to a friend's house to play video games. If he's going to youth group, I get to go to youth group. If he's playing ultimate frisbee in the park, I get to do that. If he's climbing a 14er, I get to climb a 14er. Whatever I saw my older brother doing, I got excited because it's like, I'm going to get to do that. <laughs> and the beauty of the gospel to us this morning is that we are all younger siblings of Jesus. He is the firstborn from the dead and the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And so oldest siblings, you too get to be a younger sibling. And let me tell you, it's good news because we see Jesus rising from the dead. And that means that we too one day, as sure as he burst forth from the tomb 2,000 years ago, we too at the end of time, Death will not have the last word. We'll burst forth from the grave. And Jesus, as he makes the new creation, will invite us into it as God's covenant people. And we'll get to enjoy resurrection life with him forever. And so welcome to the brotherhood <laughs> of the younger brothers of Jesus, our older brother. And so that Jesus rises from the dead, second, means that we will all be resurrected. But the third thing that Jesus, the firstborn from the dead, means to us is that Jesus' resurrection life bursts forth in unexpected places. Let's come back to John chapter 11. In verse 25, Jesus responds to Martha and says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. I mentioned that in first century, in the first century Jewish worldview that everyone, uh, most people expected that at the end of time, God would resurrect his, his faithful covenant partners for the world to come. But what nobody expected is that one man in the middle of history would burst forth from the grave. Nobody saw that coming, even with all the Old Testament predictions that, in retrospect, the church saw, oh, Jesus fulfilled this, Jesus fulfilled that. Our psalm talks about the, the son of David being the firstborn. It's a prophecy about Jesus, but no one saw it coming. How could the human mind wrap itself around an idea that someone could rise from the dead? It was just inconceivable. And yet, this is what is true about our Lord is that transformation can happen because of the resurrection from the dead that Jesus brought. And so after Jesus has this conversation with Martha, he says, take me to the tomb. And Jesus takes us to those places of death, of pain, and of barrenness. When maybe we cried out to Jesus while there still seemed to be hope and it seems like he's shown up too late. Mary and Martha let Jesus know your friend Lazarus is sick and he tarried, he waited. He didn't immediately come. And by the time Jesus shows up, it looks too late. Lazarus is cold and in the tomb. And so Jesus says, take me to the tomb. 
And so Mary and Martha lead him to the tomb and Jesus weeps because he loves his friend. And he, and he is, again, this is, this is the Lord, the word who spoke all creation into being, entering into fallen humanity, this fallen world, and he suffers the pain of it. He sits for a moment or for a while, we don't know how long, in the pain of death, having lost his friend. Jesus takes us to those places. And then he says, roll away the stone. And I love how the King James puts it. Mary and Martha respond, but Lord, he stinketh. (laughs) He stinketh. (laughs) The the guy's been dead for four days. He stinketh. Don't roll. (laughs) This is not a good time to roll the stone away, Jesus. I don't know if you know how decomposition works, but this is not a good time. Jesus, having shown up too late, says, roll the stone away. And so they finally do it. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And all wrapped in the grave clothes, he walks out of the tomb. What looks like Jesus showing up too late is not too late. Because Jesus will not let death have the last word. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He will yield first place to no one and nothing, especially death. And so he calls Lazarus from the tomb and resurrection reality brings about transformation in these places of heartbreak and pain that are, that are, that are a part of our story that we wish weren't there. Jesus says, take me to the tomb. Take me to the place of your death, your barrenness, your evil, your sin, because I'm in the business of redeeming everything. Not even death has the last word. And a few months or a few years later, Jesus, having lived a very, uh, a very wildly successful ministry, is strung up on the cross for your sin and for mine. And it looks like this, this uh, revolutionary Messiah rabbi has been a failure. And all humanity scoffs at him. Even the thief next to him mocks him. And he's buried in the tomb. And after the Sabbath day, The disciples, some women, come with herbs and spices to anoint his decaying body, to pay reverence to their failed Messiah, and are so surprised to encounter him living and breathing. Jesus' resurrection life breaks in in unexpected places. And lest we think that this is just limited to a historical reality or a a future hope, Jesus' resurrection life breaks in here and now in history. No one expected one man to rise from the dead. And Jesus is in the business of transforming people and transforming broken stories. Romans 8, 11 says that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the spirit that dwells in you and in me. The spirit of the resurrection of Jesus is alive and well in you, brothers and sisters who are included in Christ. And I just want to bring up one example of this in the Apostle Peter. Peter became a great man, a great representative for the faith, but he didn't always do a great job leading up to that. You know, he was was so faithful to, as Jesus is walking on the water toward the boat in the midst of a storm, Peter says, "If Jesus, if it's you, let me walk on the water. Call me out to join you. He says, come. And so Jesus, or Peter steps out onto the waves and he's able to walk on the waves and then he freaks out. <laughs> and he, he loses sight of the Lord and he starts sinking and Jesus grabs him and saves him. Peter is a little bit, um, he struggles. And thank God for Peter because I feel like I struggle and, and I can so relate with him. You know, one moment he's chopping off guy's ears to defend Jesus and Jesus heals his ear. He's like, Peter, it's okay. It's okay. Put it away. And then the next moment he's denying his savior. He says, I never knew the man and makes a vow of, I never knew him. He denies him three times before Jesus is crucified because he, he's so afraid of losing his life. And the resurrected Lord appears to him and says three times, once for each denial, Peter, do you love me? And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know, I love you. And Jesus reinstates him for ministry saying, feed my sheep. 
Jesus takes us to these uncomfortable places that we would rather just pass over, that we'd rather sweep under the rug. Jesus brings us back and says, I'm not done with that part of your story yet. That ugly part that you wish, that you want no one to know about, I know about it. And I love you, and I'm in the business of redeeming these broken and dead places, these places even of sin and evil. We're going back there because resurrection life is a real possibility here and now. And I just want to give witness to the Lord for some things that he's doing in my life in this season that I thought I would never be free from in this life. The Holy Spirit is at work in my life, bringing resurrection life and freedom in ways that my heart has so longed for for years. And honestly, I'd given up hope saying I've tried everything. I've tried everything and there's, there's nothing that can be done about this. Some wise mentors pointed me back to Jesus, pointed me back to the Holy Spirit and said, oh, there's hope, but no one can do it but him. And he's doing it. And if you're anything like me, there are other places of pain, of difficulty from my past, fears about the future that the Lord has not yet dealt with where I am still so painfully aware that I inhabit a fallen, broken creation and that I am a fallen, broken creature. And yet the resurrection preaches the good news to you and to me, don't give up on those places. Because in the end, there will be redemption. And don't rule out redemption and resurrection transformation in time. Here and now. Because our Lord is in the business of taking places of death and turning them into places of life. He turns the tomb into a womb of new life. And he can take your and my places of death and transform them into places of new birth. And so I just want to ask, where have you lost hope? Where have you lost hope? Where, what are pl- those places in your heart and your story? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a sin where you, you, you've ju- you just want to throw in the towel and say, yeah, I've, I've prayed for this person to come to know Christ for decades and they haven't. Or I've struggled with this sin for decades and it's just not budging. The resurrection reminds us that there is hope because Jesus' resurrection life bursts forth in unexpected places. And so in conclusion, Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, which means he is Lord over all creation, old and new. He is the hinge point. We will all be resurrected at the end of time because Jesus, our older brother, was resurrected to new life. And third, nothing's off the table. Because Jesus' Jesus resurrection life bursts forth in unexpected places. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that in time 2,000 years ago, there was a man who conquered death. Because that man was also the son of God. Thank you, Lord, that good and evil are not equal and opposite forces. But God, you are the source of all things. You are the alpha and the the omega, the beginning and the end, and death and evil and sin is no match for you. We praise you, Lord, for this gospel reality. God, we thank you for the hope that you've given us of the resurrection, of all things being made new, of every tear being wiped away, death, sin, pain being no more. We thank you for this gospel hope. And Lord Jesus, in this very moment, in this morning, we bring to you those tender places in our hearts where we have unfulfilled hopes, where we struggle with sin, where there may be relationships that are unreconciled and it hurts God. Thank you that you take us to these places, not for our destruction, but for resurrection transformation. And so, Jesus, we bring to you these places that apart from you have no hope. And we just say our eyes are on you, Lord. Our only hope is in you, and yet it is a sure and certain hope. Bring your healing. Spirit, speak the words you know we need to hear in these places of barrenness and pain. You are the risen Lord, and we worship you. Jesus, we give you first place, the firstborn from the dead. Amen.